do when they work together. And I became, I, I started as an analyst. I eventually became a division chief managing dozens of analysts. I wrote articles for the presidential daily brief. I represented us abroad. And it's that experience of seeing people united in a great cause across those divisions and working together where kind of yelling, posturing isn't an option. It just gives me this incredible sense of optimism. And I want to bring that with me to Congress along with the career national security expertise, which I think is really important right now. The other part of it is that beyond the professional background, personally, I'm someone who grew up in a family where my dad was between jobs growing up. He had multiple sclerosis. We worried about pre-existing conditions when he was between jobs and he struggled with addiction. And it was part of why I lost him when I was 17. And as an adult, I'm a middle-class mom. I grew up middle-class. I'm still middle-class. And I've got the daycare costs and the student loans to show for it. My son, my older son's in public school. So I think that someone that has that perspective of both national level expertise and then the real hopes, dreams, challenges of middle-class families, we need more of that perspective in Congress. All right, and we can dig into that a little bit more, but let's set the stage for this race a little bit. So the Massachusetts 3rd District is currently represented by a Democrat, But that person is retiring. And so now uh, there is this primary on September 4th uh, to determine who will be the next Democratic nominee. This is a D plus nine district. So although there is a Republican also running in the general, it's likely to come down to the primary. Is that your, your sense of the race as well? It is likely, but I take nothing for granted that this will be a Democratic seat, and that um, after 2016, I don't think anyone can take anything for granted in politics anymore. Right. And this district is a diverse district with a, um, a number of cities and towns that voted for Donald Trump. Hmm. So that is something that we need to think about as we consider the race. And for myself, it's part of my pitch in that I do believe that I am also the best candidate to face off against the Republican nominee and that Democrats can sometimes be put down in terms of our national security expertise or lack thereof. I can't. The Republican nominee talks about being a small business owner, that he's the only one who understands what it's like to run a payroll. I was on the board of Community Health Center where I had to worry about keeping the lights on and 12,000 patients' health care was on the line. So I'm, I'm well prepared to make not only the primary election case, but the general election case. And this primary is extremely crowded, (laughs) which makes a certain amount of sense. Probably seats in Massachusetts don't come open that often for Democrats to run. So can you talk a little bit about uh, this this primary race and, and what you're doing right now on the ground campaigning? There are 10 people in the Democratic primary, and that both creates a challenge in terms of standing out in such a primary and also an opportunity in that the number of votes one needs to win is much smaller than one would normally see in a congressional primary. And for us, what's that, what that has meant is that our campaign is a progressive campaign, the big, bold agenda, and one that is financed by working class and middle class people's donations. Our median donation for the campaign is $27. And that is in contrast to some of the other campaigns for race who have raised massive amounts of money from very wealthy donors. And what that has enabled us to do is to have a contrast for us in both. We have very detailed progressive plans and policies. So almost everyone in the race is progressive on most issues. We have a lot of detail and we have this independence from big money politics that is really getting a good response from the voters. And we have the opportunity to actually pull off a victory being such a campaign where in a smaller field where candidates would just duke it out on TV, that might not be the case, but we see a path to victory. And it's getting validated every day when we knock on doors and we look at the response rate, the people that 
when they hear the message, they want to be with us. So I've seen a lot of videos on your Twitter feed out canvassing. Have you been doing a lot of canvassing? Do you have a, a team with you that's going around? And, and what you, you mentioned the, the response a little bit, but what kinds of responses are you getting from people at the doors? We have multiple teams working throughout the district canvassing every day. And we're a very um, sort of distributed campaign in that we have volunteers that are simply signing up to Canvas and they sign up, we give them a list and they go as independent operators. So we have this network throughout the entire district. When I go, there may be one or two other people with me. That's it. It's not, no more than that because we want to cover the maximum ground. And the responses that we're getting, it's, I have a candidacy that brings in a very broad coalition of people in that there are very progressive voters that see things like the federal job guarantee on my platform. They see not only single payer health care, but all the steps that I would take along the way to improve health care and lower costs. They see not just a gun safety plan, but the fact that I have a personal story of when my son's school in D.C. was on lockdown for a shooting across the street. And they'll respond to different things on that platform. And we'll have the progressives that respond to a lot of what I just mentioned. But then we'll have independent voters who see my national security expertise and they say, yes, we need that now. Or we need someone who's grounded in service where this isn't about just kind of getting another political position, but this is a continuation of a record of service. And then we have other voters who even may have voted for Donald Trump, who had this just real concern that the political system is broken and they want to disrupt it. And they felt that voting for Donald Trump was the way to disrupt it in their minds. They saw him as someone who would be independent of the money in politics, couldn't be bought, not corrupt. I don't see him in any of those ways. That's how they see him. But in their mind, they can look at me and say, she can't be bought. Her campaign is receiving all these $27 donations. She has a record of service. I trust her to go to Washington and represent people like me because she struggled and she gets me. So we have this very diverse coalition of voters, which is again, part of where we see our path to victory. So let's talk some about your uh, experience in the intelligence community and sure. what you see as sort of the, the challenges right now and the challenges that Congress can help us work through. So of course we have a, a president right now who is, <laughs> vehemently, outspokenly uh, hostile to the intelligence community. But we have a number of growing threats internationally uh, for which it's really important that we have a, a functioning intelligence community. So can you talk a little bit about sort of what you see as the, the threats right now and what you think Congress can and should be doing to make sure that our intelligence community is protected? On the good side first, what I'll say is because I'm still in touch with many friends and colleagues within the intelligence community, national security community, and other federal agencies, at the working level, so much continues as it should, notwithstanding the rhetoric. There's a lot of words that Donald Trump uses with regard to our intelligence community, national security, law enforcement that are not helpful that send the wrong signals to particularly our adversaries, but also our allies. But the work continues largely, notwithstanding anything he does. The, the issue where I see it is where he does send signals to our adversaries or to would-be challengers that at least the President of the United States and the White House is not willing to stand up for America when we are under attack in terms of the integrity of our democratic processes, such as with the Russians' interference with our election. But then also by his 
attitude with our allies, our oldest and best democratic partners, where he denigrates them, notwithstanding, say, Canada's contribution to our security right after 9-11, when they were among the first to be sending flights over the continental United States and participating in taking in all of the stranded passengers when we had to ground all of our flights or all the other members of NATO who've been with us in Afghanistan and Iraq. And that is a real danger because we'll need those allies in the future. We need them not just in a military context, but in a trade context, in our shared efforts to combat climate change. We need them. And he is making us less safe, less secure because of that. He is making the intelligence community, the Defense Department, the State Department's mission all the more difficult. And that coupled with the ongoing threats of our adversaries, Russia's interference with our democratic processes, their ambitions in Ukraine and elsewhere in Eastern Europe, China's challenge to stability in the Pacific Rim, he is making those challenges more difficult. And that's where what I would say Congress can really step in and Take, take a more proactive posture when it comes to national security and foreign policy. For too long, the executive branch, and this predated Donald Trump, has been given a blank check in many ways when it comes to our activities abroad, particularly our military interventions. And that that's something where I would see an opportunity for me as a member of Congress to be a leader in things like repealing the authorization for use of military force that we passed after 9-11, which is part of why we have forces in combat roles in so many different countries that the average American doesn't even know about. And that that's something where Congress, if they repeal that blank check and have to debate the merits of those interventions, I think we will find ourselves in a more secure place in terms of well, our national security as well as be able to restore balance between our diplomatic efforts, our development activities, and use of our military, which will also mean cost savings that we can reinvest in domestic priorities that have been far too long neglected. If you are elected, you will be the first transgender congressperson that we've had in U.S. Yeah. Congress. And I, I remember reading when you first announced your candidacy about the story of uh, when you came out and started transitioning during your time in the intelligence community. Can you talk a little bit about that story? I think it's in many ways very heartening. <laughs> and I, I think yeah. that it it's, uh, would be really nice for our listeners to hear it. From earliest childhood, I knew that I was different in some way. And by the time that puberty hit, I knew I was transgender. But with the death of my father when I was 17, I very much buried that. I buried it with him in many ways because I just felt that I couldn't put my family through transition. It just was too much. By the time I was a little older and had joined the intelligence community, those feelings were coming back. Identity has a way of coming back. And much as I tried to bury it again, I couldn't. And though I loved what I was doing, my job in the intelligence world, in 2005, I went to my chain of command and told them very late 2005 that um, I am transgender and that I will probably have to leave the organization because at the time it was, there was no protection for transgender people serving in the federal government, I could be fired at will. And I expected that I would either be fired or that I would go after buttoning up things. Instead, I was welcomed. I was embraced. The chain of command simply said, you're part of the team. We will accommodate you in any way that you need. And they did that even when things got tough, because I, I told my teammates, I told the chain of command, they responded well, but when it, the word of my transition got out to the overall workforce, 
there was a town hall 